delighted to say another very good friend of mine, Keith Fox, who actually was the first speaker at our original cardiology at the limits meeting before we became nephrology and diabetes in 1997 in Cape Town. It's lovely to welcome you back, Keith. Thank you very much. Derek, thank, thank you. And uh, I'm delighted that the limits have moved just a little bit, as uh, you know, earlier speakers in this symposium ha have said. So my title is uh, Prevention of Cardiovascular Events and coronary or, uh, in Coronary or Peripheral Artery Disease, uh, and raising the question about uh, limits. And uh, these are my uh, disclosures and de declarations. So the questions that I want to raise is that we currently have an array of secondary prevention measures uh, against atheromatous events. And these are in patients with documented vascular disease. Is it worthwhile having something further? Are the event rates sufficient to justify that? And are our current treatments as good as it gets? Or is there scope for clinic, uh, further improvement? And critically, is the further improvement clinically worthwhile before we address even health economic issues? So let me take you back a decade from the GRACE program, which was the largest, and still is in fact, the largest international registry program in acute coronary disease of 102,000 patients. We demonstrated that after the first in-hospital phase, then the patients here shown as those with ST-segment depression, in other words, the non-ST elevation MIs, have an ongoing event rate which surprisingly, even adjusted for baseline risk, is worse than the survivors of ST elevation infarction. And it's worse because there's continuing event rates. And we've looked at this in more detail. Are these event rates um, important? And how many are there? And let's take a look. So for example, we looked and we've t taken a study from the UK and Belgium, almost identical results in the UK and Belgium. And these are the five-year death rates in the survivors who've left hospital alive. So if we think as cardiologists we're doing a great job, we're doing a pretty good job in acute care, but we're not doing such a good job afterwards because there's about one in five who are dead five years later. And then we look more carefully. And if as cardiologists we're tempted to say to our patients, you know, we've treated your heart attack. Things are great now. We've got you on all the right secondary prevention. What we maybe should be saying to that patient, yes, we've treated your acute event, but maybe two-thirds or more of the events that you're likely to have are ahead of you instead of be behind you. And that's chilling. And it suggests to us that perhaps we haven't done enough. And we've looked even more detail at some of the late consequences after ACS. And here we are looking at uh, not just single events, but also recurrent events. And it tells us that these late consequences are both underestimated and underrecognized. Underestimated why? If we take trials, we identify the time to first event. Not all the events, the time to first event. And here we've looked at all the events because we're, con we're considering uh, the cumulative effect on the patient and the recurrent MIs, revascularization, strokes. And these are unstable angina admissions with an abnormal uh, ECG. Now you say, OK. That's a decade ago. Things must be much better, and perhaps they are much better in France, and much better in the US, and much better in Sweden. Well, in this work uh, led by Harry Hemingway, 
This is from big data. And it's from the large uh, data sets in the respective countries, 114,000 survivors of MI. And it tell, tells us a couple of things. They particularly looked at those over 65 years of age and who'd already survived for a year. And then look over the next three years, what we can see is that there is a further uh, death rate beyond the first year, and that's about uh, almost one in five, even adjusting for baseline risk. The interesting thing is then the lines come closer together, but still about one in five further event rates. So if we think that we've got it sorted, the critics turn around and say, well, you know, if you just got them on all the right secondary prevention, you'd never have seen all these problems. It would have been fixed. Well, our colleagues in the Timmy study group, and I was not involved in this study, but I have been involved in others with the Timmy group. This is a diraplidib. It was a very interesting way of modifying uh, lipid behavior in the vessel wall. Unfortunately, it did nothing. The active group in yellow was superimposed upon the placebo group in green. But the critically important thing here is these were patients who were extremely well treated with secondary prevention. And what's more, the highest risk group with comorbidities were excluded. So these are the good candidates for a trial, very well treated. And what's the message? The message is that 15% of these had cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke at the end of 36 months. So this answers the question. It's not just under-treatment in the registry populations. Actually, even among those who are very well treated, are there still this important event rate? And that's contemporary secondary prevention. And let's consider a couple of other issues. You know, we've heard yesterday elegant talks about how we tend to think in silos. And we confess as cardiologists, we do think in silos. We should be thinking about the overlap of coronary disease with cerebrovascular disease and peripheral artery disease so that of the patients with coronary disease, at least a quarter have disease in the other beds that's manifest, that's already manifest. And if we were to search hard, that proportion would be higher. And if your patient or mine presents with peripheral artery disease, then over 60% have manifest disease in one of the other territories. So let's get away from silo thinking that we're just thinking about the coronary artery. We're thinking about vascular disease, and we're thinking about the overlaps. So let's recap on some of the existing treatment strategies, and we should not underestimate the importance of these. So control of cardiovascular risk factors to limit atherosclerosis progression and perhaps stabilize plaques. And you've heard yesterday um, from Graham McGregor about how smoking cessation, regular exercise, diet, weight management, salt restriction, sugar restriction, these are all important. The medical therapies that are already in our guidelines in terms of lipid management, hypertension control, diabetes management. And then the prevention of blood clots uh, over ruptured or eroded plaques. And at the moment, for stable patients, for stable vascular risk patients, either side of the Atlantic, the recommended antithrombotic treatment is aspirin alone. And if you can't take aspirin, clopidogrel. That's it. That's it. So let's look at some of the guideline-indicated secondary prevention. 
And what's the impact? So I've used the same measures, and uh, this is uh, the combined MI death stroke event rates, or the individual event rates, and one millimole lipid lowering, important reductions in MACE, uh, reductions of about 9% in mortality, reductions in stroke, and reductions in MI. 10 millimeters, 10 millimeters, this is not one millimeter, this is 10 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, uh, redu uh, event rate reductions which are almost commensurate, ACE inhibitors, important reduction, aspirin, 19% reduction in this composite endpoint, non-significant impact on death, a, tr a reduction in mortality, and reduction in MI. So let's think about some of the potential mechanisms in relation to the thrombotic events and our, our treatment options. We've talked earlier in this uh, conference about uh, the, the, what's happening in the vessel and in the, in the plaque and the atherobitus plaque, the tissue factors, uh, the triggering of both thrombus and platelets, the rupture of the plaques, and that's very well known to us. Perhaps less well known to us is the interaction between platelet mechanisms and thrombin activation. Do you know there's still hematology textbooks that have these in different chapters? But the most potent stimulus for thrombin activation comes from activated platelets. And in turn, the platelet receptor is triggered by thrombin. So in the past, we've again been guilty of silo thinking that we should hammer one pathway. And perhaps what we need to consider is a way of partially inhibiting the thrombin cascade and partially inhibiting platelet activation. Because when we hammer one pathway, we don't affect the other, and we suffer from the complications of that single pathway. So in the past, we've used effectively antiplatelets in the post-ACS setting and after stents, and we've used anticoagulants in atrial fibrillation, for example, and in other thrombotic conditions. So we've talked a little bit about how activated platelets are really a potent mechanism for thrombin activation. So this is what's in the European guidelines. The European guidelines for patients with chronic stable. I'm distinguishing from the ACS. So this is by the time the patient has chronic stable vascular disease. Aspirin's recommended, or clopidogrel if you can't take it. And peripheral artery disease, somewhat similar. So, uh, Derek, maybe this is a reflection of cardiology at the limits because back in the time of the anti-platelet uh, uh, trialist collaboration, <laughs> control and aspirin, event rates were higher. At the time of the Capri study, even longer ago, these were the event rates in that trial. That in, they, were, they were more restrictive than in the ATT. I was involved in the design and conduct of the Charisma trial, here, Pegasus, this is with Ticagrelor, and this is with Voropaxar, the platelet thrombin receptor antagonist. So event rates have been creeping down over the course of time. And you can see, in each case, the light blue shows a slightly lower event rate than the purple color. So that's what we have as background therapy in chronic coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease. Let's look again at our old friend warfarin. You know, um, perhaps we've forgotten about the fact that warfarin has an effect in terms of not only reducing ischemic stroke in atrial fibrillation, but also reducing MI. No absolute effect on death, but 
hazards in bleeding. Uh, 2.5-fold increase in major bleeding. So this is the reason why, against aspirin, warfarin has not been systematically adopted. So let's move on to the modern era. Can we do better than warfarin? This comes from a large-scale phase two trial, a dose-ranging trial with uh, rivaroxaban, and it was the 2.5 milligram BD dose. So this is one quarter of the atrial fibrillation dose, one quarter, or a half of the atrial fibrillation dose. And it was a dose-ranging trial on the background of either aspirin or aspirin and P2Y12, asking the questions about uh, trends in efficacy and bleeding. And the answer was the lowest dose had strong trends in efficacy and least bleeding. And then the large-scale trial, and this is the uh, ATLAS ACS2 trial, this trial uh, was conducted in uh, 15,500 patients after ACS. And it was asking whether the addition of rivaroxaban 2.5 milligrams BD um, after the acute phase reduces MI stroke or cardiovascular death. And the answer is yes, or cause death, yes. But non-cabbage major bleeding increased, and there was even a small but significant increase in intracranial hemorrhage, no increase in fatal bleeding. So this pre presented a dilemma. This side of the Atlantic, this agent is approved after ACS. In North America, it's not. And obviously, there's a balance between efficacy and bleeding. Other agents have been tested. So if a little bit's good, maybe more is better. Well, the answer is no. The, with apixaban, which is a very effective uh, a NOAC in atrial fibrillation, very effective, more effective than warfarin, the investigators of APRAISE-2 tested this is the full atrial fibrillation dose after ACS. And they had to stop the trial early because of bleeding. So there's nothing magical about that drug in reducing bleeding. There was excess bleeding. This is major and minor bleeding. And here you can see it over the first 30 days and over 400 days. So it had to be stopped early because of excess bleeding. And this is not being pursued. So we took a different strategy. The strategy that we took was to say, let's use a very small dose of an anti-10A inhibition in the presence of some platelet inhibition. And I've given you the rationale, in both in terms of aspirin and some of the prior evidence with warfarin. So let's go for a moment. And um, you'd rightly say that after ACS, Ticagrelor is much better than clopidogrel. No doubt about that. Very clear evidence from the PLATO trial. So let's look in peripheral vascular disease whether Ticagrelor, now this is the stable patients, whether it's better than clopidogrel, and the answer is no. So this is a more potent, more effective P2Y12 in, uh, inhibitor. It doesn't have some of the problems that clopidogrel has in terms of hyporesponsiveness and so-called resistance. But in chronic stable patients, simply using a more potent antiplatelet was not sufficient. Was not sufficient. Very interestingly, if you look at the Socrates trial, so these are people who've had the equivalent of an ACS, but in the carotid artery, TIA, and recovered, or minor stroke event. Then there is a trend, but non-significant. So again, there was no clear evidence of benefit 
just hammering a more potent P2Y12 antagonist. And actually, there was more major and minor bleeding. So where are we with the alternatives to aspirin alone? From the original Capri trial, you can see that this is, there were reductions. This is substituting clopidogrel in place of aspirin, a 9% relative risk reduction, which is not too impressive. No significant reduction in cardiovascular death. Those were not uh, sufficiently measured in that trial. An excess, minus means an excess of bleeds. So it's minus benefit. Charisma. I was involved in the Charisma trial. It overall was um, non-significant, only trends, but a reduction within the trial, interesting in terms of stroke, but an excess of major bleeds. The Pegasus trial, so this is taking patients a year after their MI and then continuing for three years, and very interesting results. Reductions in uh, the combined endpoint, but cardiovascular death not reduced, with the lower dose reduction in stroke, uh, some reduction in MI, but excess bleeds, 169%, 132%. And this is with the Vorapaxar, the platelet thrombin receptor antagonist, and you can see the corresponding results. So we have an array, but no... Uh, absolute dominant winner amongst those. Now, very interestingly, there's a lateral approach. And Paul Ridker has presented these data and published them. And this is a very interesting, different concept. That is saying, okay, these patients have got either inflammatory risk or lipid risk. And what he's suggested is that obviously high-intensity statin is needed, and some patients still have residual high LDL, but not particularly high uh, C-reactive protein, whereas other groups have reduced their LDL but have high C-reactive protein. And you know that there have been earlier trials of different agents to reduce inflammation, and most of those have either been inconclusive or have not been very successful. And the concept here was to say that uh, a variety of different mechanisms from the cholesterol crystals through the neutrophil extracellular traps, some of the changes in flow, changes in hypoxia, may influence the so-called inflammasome, and a key pathway is the IL-1 beta into its active form and the agent used in the CANTOS trial is catechinumab, inhibiting this pathway to see if it can change outcome. A lot of people were very skeptical. But the answer was, it did. It did, and the hazard ratio was 0.85. Remember, that is over about four and a half years. And uh, there was about a 40% reduction in CRP, no change in LDL. So this is not an LDL-mediated mechanism. But let's look at the absolute event rates. The absolute event rates in the placebo group, 4.5 per 100 patient years, canicunumab, 4.11 per 100 patient years. So in other words, a difference of four per thousand. And you have to decide, is that clinically worthwhile? Very interestingly, there may be more down the line because the greater the reduction in CRP, the, uh, the larger the effect. And very interestingly, and I'm not presenting these, are the outcome events on cancer deaths. That needs to be validated, but very interesting. Raised interesting hypotheses. So from the Cantos study, all deaths, non-significant, cardiovascular deaths, non-significant, stroke, non-significant, and 
There weren't necessarily entirely consistent effects for the doses, but very interesting mechanistic uh, study, I think, opens uh, a number of questions. Now, some people may say, right, we know statins work. Lipid lowering works. Let's hit it harder with PCSK9 inhibition. And I'm going to show you the results of just one of the two key trials that have been done. Both are largely consistent. So this is PCSK9 inhibition, adequately powered, 19,000 patients treated for three years. So this is profoundly lowering LDL. And if you look by in, in, um, on treatment, it's about a halving of LDL on top of background treatment. And obviously, by intention to treat, some people come off. And it's about um, uh, a third reduction. And the answer is, there was a significant reduction in the combined endpoint of coronary heart disease, death, non-fatal MI, ischemic stroke, and unstable angina. And that reduction, that composite reduction, is about 1.6% over the course of four years. So the primary composite is reduced by about 1.6%, um, but no difference in CHD death, no difference in all-cause death. So we have a couple of approaches, either profound LDL lowering, perhaps modification of um, the uh, inflammation. What about the idea of altering the uh, um, thrombotic risk by using a, uh, a very low dose of a, a novel anti 10 a alongside aspirin? And this is the uh, result. And um, uh, as a declaration, I co-chaired this uh, uh, COMPASS uh, trial with Salem Yusuf and John Eichelboom presented these at the ESC. So, adequately powered. This is a trial designed by the academic group, conducted by the academic group, analyzed and published, so entirely independently. 27,000 patients, and uh, adequately powered in terms of event rates. And there was a key question, and that is, against the standard of care, and on top of, on top of, best current secondary prevention. Would rivaroxaban alone in five milligrams BD, so that's half of the atrial fibrillation dose, without aspirin, be better, worse, or the same? Or a quarter dose on top of aspirin, would it be better, worse, or the same? And we expected the trial to go for about four years. We set up in the guidance for the Data Safety Monitoring Committee that before they recommended any early stopping of the trial, there should be at least four standard deviations in terms of efficacy. They met a couple of times and concluded that there was more than four standard deviations so the trial had to be stopped prematurely. That always raises issues, because any trial stopped prematurely could be stopped at an extreme. These are the curves. And what I show you in red is the reference arm, aspirin. It was not apparent that this is any uh, sudden extreme. And if you look at the tracking of events, it's consistent over time. The rivaroxaban, five milligrams a BD alone was an intermediate result, and the rivaroxaban 2.5 BD plus aspirin had the largest effect. And this is a hazard ratio of 0.76, lots of zeros. In absolute terms, what we're talking about is 4.1% versus 5.4%. So it's about a 1.5% uh, absolute, uh, it's a 1.3% absolute uh, risk reduction uh, over the course of about 22 months. 
and there's the hazard ratio. Whereas the rivaroxaban alone versus aspirin was trending but not significant. Look at the components of the, of the primary outcome. You can see that cardiovascular death alone, 1.7 versus 2.2 was significant. Stroke, highly significant, about a 42% reduction in stroke. MI, a strong trend for MI, not independently significant. Combining MI with sudden death or resuscitated cardiac arrest, etc., produced a significant result which is consistent with the trial as a whole. The secondary outcomes, so this is coronary heart disease death, ischemic stroke, MI, or acute limb ischemia. Cardiology, we don't often measure acute limb ischemia. Highly significant reduction. And this is cardiovascular death with those consistent. This is overall mortality. All-cause mortality was significant at the 0.01 level. Uh, what about the price to pay in terms of bleeding. There is a price to pay. At major bleeding, you can see the hazard ratio is 1.7. So in absolute terms, you can see 1.9 here versus 3.1. So it's about a 1.2% increase in major bleeding. And this is using a more sensitive ISTH definition than the original. And fatal bleeding trends, but non-significant, ICH non-significant, and others non-significant. Interestingly, as has been shown for aspirin, you can do a bleeding tolerance test. And the bleeding tolerance test is you expose the patient in the first year, and that's when most of their bleeding risk is. After the first year, the, there is no apparent excess of bleeding, whereas efficacy shows similar trends over the course of time. And what we as clinicians are interested in is what's the net clinical benefit. And the net clinical benefit, you might consider cardiovascular death, stroke, MI, fatal bleeding, or symptomatic critical bleeding, and there's still about a 20% risk reduction. Whether you got into the trial with coronary disease or with peripheral artery disease didn't matter. There's still the same risk reduction. Now, very interestingly, we know nowadays it's a hazard being a male, but this is not what I'm talking about. This is major adverse limb event. And uh, you know, our colleagues in peripheral artery disease struggle to have therapies that are altering outcomes. This is about a halving of major adverse limb events, important reductions in amputations, putting those together, about a halving of those. And looking in the PAD cohort, again, um, a highly significant differences in favor of this combined treatment. So how does it stack up? Coming towards the end now, you can see here is the Charisma trial. These are the antithrombotics. I showed you these results of Charisma. I showed you Pegasus that clearly works. And here is Compass. The combined endpoint shows a, about a 24% reduction. Cardiovascular death is only significant in Compass. Stroke, 42% reduction. Trends for MI in, in, in compass. Bleeds, there is an excess of bleeds, not as marked as in Pegasus, uh, or uh, slightly more than in Charisma, and a trend, minor trend, in ICH. Now let's look at it against what we accept as our standards of care for lipid lowering, for 10 millimeters of blood pressure lowering, and for ACE inhibitors, and what I would say is that the extent of risk reduction is at least commensurate. And there's another factor to consider. The time has moved on. And time's moved on so that these treatments are now on top of 
the standard of care. Whereas when ACE inhibitors were tested, there wasn't the full background of lipid lowering, for example. So the conclusions from COMPASS were that this combination of a quarter dose of a NOAC and aspirin reduces cardiovascular death, MI, and stroke. It does increase major bleeding, but without a significant increase in fatal intracranial or critical organ bleeding, net clinical benefit. The drug alone was not better than aspirin. And so my final slide is that in preventing cardiovascular events, in, t in terms of coronary or peripheral, we need to remember that about one in five patients suffer death or MI at a year despite current standards of care, and another one in five at four years. There is potential for further gains with profound LDL lowering, with a modification of inflammation, with novel anticoagulant antiplatelet combinations. And these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. But the challenge for all of us is, is the gain clinically worthwhile? What's, how do you balance risk versus benefit? How do you select cohorts with the most to gain? And down the road, cost effectiveness. Thank you very much. Thank you.